Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm uh, Kevin Wack. Um, I'm a reporter with American Banker. And um, I thought we would just first um, ask the, the panelists to introduce themselves, and, and we can go from there. You want to go first, Scott? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Estrada. I'm the Director of Government Affairs at Affirm, Inc., uh, we're a point-of-sale lending company based in San Francisco. Uh, Nat Hoops, I run the Marketplace Lending Association. Uh, we're a 36-member now organization uh, launched by uh, Lending Club Prosper and Funding Circle about four years ago, and um, we've grown since and really focus in a few major areas, personal loans, uh, small business loans, student loan refinancing, um, mortgages, HELOCs, so all the all the products that the SOFIs and lending clubs and firms um, offer, and we also represent the investors. So we have an investor council, and so it's really a diverse group, of companies, and um, we're all pushing for uh, sound public policy, including adhering to the 36% APR standard that's in the Federal Military Lending Act and in the FDIC's guidance. Hi, everyone. I'm Ellen Harnick, and I am with the Center for Responsible Lending. I'm based here in Oakland, and um, but covering states across the country. The Center for Responsible Lending, as you probably know, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and policy organization. We are affiliated with the Self-Help Credit Union, which has a federal and state chartered credit union uh, with retail branches across California, across North Carolina, and uh, several Midwestern states and some Southeastern states. Glad to be here. Hi, I'm Eileen Newhall. I'm the staff director with the California Senate Banking and Financial Institutions Committee. In my role with that committee, one of my jobs is to write balanced analyses of the bills that come before the committee. And one of the ways in which I try to do that is by getting outside the Capitol, attending forums like this and others to actually talk with practitioners rather than simply relying upon what lobbyists are telling me. So thank you for the opportunity. So um, we're obviously here to discuss bank uh, fintech partnerships in California. Um, and this is, a, 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 we have a, obviously a very sophisticated audience, but it's a complex sort of policy landscape. You know, just the federal issues alone are, I think, very complex. The, the, then there's the state overlay. Um, which is, I think, particularly um, interesting and, and complicated in California right now. Um, so I thought just to start out, even though I think um, we do have an audience that's probably pretty deeply steeped in these issues, it would be helpful to just kind of go through some of the, um, what will hopefully be sort of the, the uh, uh, tent, po tent poles of our discussion today. So first I wanted to ask Nat about kind of the, the federal landscape, the, you know, the Madden v. Midland decision, the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking from the FDIC and, and the OCC uh, sort of valid when made versus true lender issues and kind of anything else you see that's sort of, you know, important for this discussion from a sort of federal perspective. Um, thank you, Kevin. Uh, so I think as I mentioned, we have a diverse group, um, but a significant number of our uh, member organizations are part of the bank partnerships, uh, including Cross River and Web Bank, and um, you know those that operate responsibly. And you know we we have seen the real bipartisan support um, for the concept of valid when made. So for those who aren't steeped in the issue, um, about four or five years ago, a decision in the Second Circuit. Um, that was challenged by the Obama administration's security um, uh, um, solicitor general, um, essentially found that a, a loan that once made could not be transferred um, subsequently and enforced by a non-bank. And so that decision up in the Second Circuit, which is New York, uh, Connecticut, and Vermont, really threw into question um, a whole host of uh, the consumer finance market because, as we know, credit card securitizations um, involve a significant number of loans with uh, exported interest rates, which are then transferred to non-bank investors, um, as well as the marketplace lending models. And so people had questions, and academics have studied the issue and found that um, post that decision, you saw an increase in personal bankruptcies. So um, that was a study by researchers at the University of Shanghai. Um, and then also you've seen a dramatic uh, 
curtailment of credit for people with uh, credit scores under 625, uh, and in a, you know 52 percent decline in credit, um, worse pricing, and so you've had a you know real harm that have come from the lack of liquidity because the broader the market that can purchase loans, the lower the risk premium and the spreads at the front end, right? So um, supply, classic supply and demand. And so people have really, um, in our view, been harmed. And that's why the Obama Solicitor General, the Obama OCC weighed in and said, no, the real concept that should be enforced is the idea of valid when made. So once a loan is truly made, if it is legitimately made by a bank, not an illegal sort of scheme, but a true bank loan, um, then that original interest rate ought to be able to be enforced um, forever. And so that's the sort of key concept, I think, that, um, you know, has now elicited a lot of, you know, different back and forth. But the OCC and the FDIC now transitioning from that original support from the Obama regulators now to Trump appointed regulators are now proposing a rule that would actually essentially enshrine that in federal regulation. Um, and so there's a hearing today, obviously, uh, that's a little bit more dealing with the true lender issues and high rate you rent a bank arrangements um, rather than valid when made. Um, but certainly you saw a lot of bipartisan support for legislation that would have addressed valid when made as well. And you know our view is that regulators do have the ability to differentiate between illegal arrangements and partnerships. Um, they blocked payday rent to bank arrangements back in 2000. And um, they can do the same, but they also don't want to depress innovation at a time when you have 4,000 community banks across the country that need to offer loans. And in order to offer those loans um, in an online context where you can get people funded in a couple of days and offer responsible loans, you really need to allow for partnerships. So that's a long-winded answer of saying there's a lot happening. Um, but uh, the, the reality is that the concept of valid when made has strong bipartisan support um, and strong regulatory support. And I think that that issue can be separated from the true lender or sort of illegal partnership issues in the high rate rent to bank payday world. Okay. Um, Alan, uh, I think you, you, your, your perspective on some of those issues may be a little bit different. So maybe you can respond to some of what Nat said, but also maybe talk a little bit. For, well, first, first, if you want to respond to what sure. Nat said, that'd be great. And then, but if you could also talk about AB 539 in California, sure. um, and kind of its fallout and kind of how it plays into these issues. Sure. So, can, just to get a sense, can you raise your hand if you know what the Madden decision was? Okay. So people are pretty seeped in the issue. Okay. So, um, thank you, Nat. That was probably as good a de description as I've heard of the um, point of view that lenders should be able to evade state rate caps by partnering with a bank. <laughs> Is that a neutral way of framing it? So let me just say something about valid when made and people who take the view that through partnerships with banks, fintech lenders should be able to evade state rate caps tend to also take the view, and I'm respectful of it, but disagree with it, take the view that valid when made is this long-standing concept that applies in this context. And some people do think that, and some people really don't. So let me just remind us, the Madden, uh, the Madden case involved a debt buyer. These are companies that, as we know, buy debts at deep discounts, maybe 10 cents on the dollar at the outside. And it wanted to enforce and collect not only on what the bank was owed, but then thereafter it wanted to collect the full uh, balance and ongoing interest rates at rates that were allowed for the bank because they have an exception to state usury laws, but not allowed for debt buyers and others. So that's the context in which it was teed up. The, the real issue derives from the fact that a Supreme Court case a few decades ago the Marquette case, uh, said that banks could lend across the country at whatever rate was authorized in the state where it was headquartered. This was a new idea, but it took off and it resulted in banks locating and headquartering in states with very, very lax, some banks, lax uh, consumer interest rate caps and then lending across the country at those rates. 
So the question that's teed up now is that since banks can now evade state interest rate caps, should it be possible for companies that are willing and able to partner with banks to likewise get away from state interest rate caps? And we would say no, and we could talk about that some more. Um, but this valid when made issue is this idea that this narrow exception that exists for banks alone should be able to be transferred and used by other companies that are not subject to this narrow statutory exception to the law. And so that's what's teed up here. The valid when made concept was never applied ever to say that um, it, the, the, it originated not in this idea that a privilege, a narrow privilege granted to a particular kind of entity should be transferable to another. The issue really was if somebody makes a loan and then the loan is sold, sold at a discount so that now if you applied that rate to the discounted balance, if you recalculated the APR, suddenly it would now be usurious. And so the valid when made concept was, no, we're not going to recalculate the, the APR after the loan is made. If it was a valid calculation at the time it was made, we're not recalculating it. And so it's been expanded as a concept to try to facilitate these bank partnerships. And that's really what's at the heart of this. I do want to say one more thing, and I say this with great respect. <laughs> I mean, I am the only consumer protection person here, so nobody is going to feel There's a lot we agree on, too, that we'll get but, into. <laughs> but the, the limited research that was cited that purported to find that in the Madden state, the Second Circuit states after the Madden decision, that purported to find that there was an increase in bankruptcies had pretty significant methodological flaws. I mean, among them, it used absolute terms to compare states with different populations rather than per capita, which is a pretty big methodological problem. There were other um, factors that were not included in the calculation. So I think it's pretty fair to say, uh, as the FDIC said, there really is no significant evidence of an impact um, on the markets as a consequence of the Madden decision. Maybe Great. I should. I'll, I'll, well, there are just two. I'll just only jump in. The only thing is there are two studies. So one, the one you reference um, is by universe, you know, foreign researchers. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that they'll probably try to address any methodological flaws, and, and maybe, maybe you're right that they won't find that bankruptcies, personal bankruptcies, were tied to a lack of available credit. But the current uh, SEC commissioner appointed by uh, President Obama, um, Robert Jackson, while he was in academia, had a different study that actually looked at the l credit availability for people and the overall pricing for people um, with credit scores under 625 and found that the amount of available credit declined 52% for people in that category post the Madden decision, while in places that were not affected by the Madden decision, credit availability increased <clears throat> by 100%. And so that's Colleen Honigsberg, who's at Stanford University, and Robert Jackson, um, who's now an SEC commissioner, um, both very credible researchers. And so I think we can all have a debate about um, you know, the type of credit and, you know, what kind of credit, you know, is good credit and bad credit. Our position, and we supported, I think we're, you know, very closely aligned with CRL and supported AB 539 out here in California, which instituted a 36% APR um, cap. Um, our, our view is just that the, in a national market where people want to borrow over the internet and you have a lot of state um, loopholes and bad products for things like rent to own and pawn shops and payday loans and so forth, that just because something is state licensed doesn't make it a good product, and that a national market for a sub-36% online loan product is an incredibly consumer-friendly product um, where you've seen relatively low defaults, you see an unsecured product that people aren't going to lose a diamond engagement ring, they're not going to... So you have a very positive evolution for consumers from, the, from this market, and um, valid when made is really a critical thing that underpins 
this idea that um, regardless of what the interest rate environment is, I mean, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are not banks, and they have to ensure that they can enforce the term of mortgages. My parents' first mortgage was at 19 percent. It would have been over the state rate caps of many states, right? And that was 1979. So in other words, the interest rate, state rate caps don't move with the Fed funds rate. And so the concept of valid when made that Fannie Freddie, Mae and Freddie Mac can enforce the original terms of mortgages made around the country um, is just critical for the overall liquidity of the secondary market and the overall functioning of the financial system. So I think that's where we have a little bit of respectful disagreement. Where we have agreement, though, is that 36% should be an emerging standard, especially for loans of larger dollar sizes and, um, and longer terms. Okay. Can I, oh, can I jump in? Sure. I, I just wanted to... Um, I do want to broaden it, but go yeah, ahead. Yeah. That, that's, so I, I just want to contextualize it because this does seem like a very... <laughs> nuanced and technical discussion, which is always good to have. But I just want to kind of broaden it first and then kind of come back to the bank partnership model from uh, a firm's point of view and as a member of MLA, um, is that, you know, from a starting point, uh, I think I can start with premises that are quite non-disputed, is that, you know, financial health is, is in crisis across the board in the U.S., especially among LMI communities, especially among communities of color, especially communities that have been marginalized from the financial credit mainstream. We talk about uh, cash flow and security. We talk about the growing wage gap. So that, that's like the broad context in which bank partnership models are providing consumer credit. Now, if we go one down, very few people, and I haven't met many, are okay with the status quo or with okay with how things are, are working for communities that are looking for inroads into credit are looking for communities with a thin credit file, especially millennials, immigrant communities, or rebuilding communities. So nobody is saying this is just fine, and if we leave things as they are, there's gonna be a natural arc to credit uh, and financial inclusion. So that, that's the context in which uh, the bank partnership model for, for a firm and what we're trying to do, especially when it comes to um, a credit model that's very bimodal in terms of you know, uh, credit prime, but uh, thin file, high income borrowers, but on the opposite spectrum, LMI communities that don't have a credit file or rebuilding credit or are below a, a, a FICO prime. So in the bank partnership model, we acknowledge and recognize that there are good actors and bad actors from a consumer protection point of view when you look at the product. So you know, we're, we're not naive and oblivious to the overall structure and the concerns that have been raised by consumer groups. but no credit product functions in a vacuum, and even under state licensed products like pawn shops, rent to own, very uh, disastrous products for consumer health, the bank partnership model functions within that ecosystem as a delivery system to provide access to credit. Now, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you at least 20 seconds of a firm's resume um, in terms of justifying that. And we don't justify ourselves by our mission. We don't justify ourselves by our mission statement. It's what is our product doing and who is it reaching? And our loans are capped at 30% APR with an average APR of 17%, simple interest installment loans, never charge a late fee, never charge a prepayment fee. And in our own internal data analysis have shown that in certain districts among LMI communities, over half our lending is done to communities that are below the median income. And these are these products with these APRs and these costs that are providing credit as an alternative to a host of other issues, including state licensed products that have triple digit in, uh, interest rates and pawn shops uh, across many states are licensed. So that, you know, that, that's kind of the context in which we talk about the bank model. And then in the recognition of what we consider to be um, dangerous products for consumers and financial health and the sustainability of credit building, uh, you know, there are ways to protect what um, is being positive for consumers on an impact level and, and ways to kind of uh, create uh, bright lines between those products that are harmful and whether that's the regulatory action, what has happened with the payday lending rent a bank in the past that Nat mentioned, or whether it's a, a federal rate cap of 36%. Those are all discussions that I think warrant revisiting outside of kind of ossified policy positions. And it's the, the discussions that a firm is excited to have. Okay, so this is probably a good segue to talk about AB 539. I want to get to Eileen, too. I'm sorry, I have 
left you out so far. I first want to ask Ellen to just kind of sure. describe what AB 539 sure. does and then, you know, how um, some of the high, high uh, interest rate lenders in California have responded sure. um, to that. And, so. Can I abuse the fact that you've given me the microphone by just asking Scott a question? <laughs> Can we agree, though, that from a firm and others' point of view, the, the idea that you're talking about, the stepping into this ecosystem, in that context, the reason for the bank partnerships, the primary significance of partnering with a bank, is the exception from state usury caps? I would say it's much more devolved. I mean, I would actually say that that, in, that may be the case when you have a, entities where 100% of the products are 100% above the APR cap, right? If literally the only purpose that you could see in a partnership is to evade the APR cap by a significant amount, then yeah, I would agree with you. In context where the bank is providing payment system, regulatory advice, help with compliance, ongoing monitoring, holding a portion of the loan, I think that the, the bank partnership model is actually quite diverse and that the benefits that accrue to both parties um, are significant. So I would actually, I would agree with you that there are those arrangements where the sole purpose for the bank partnership is to evade the state rate caps. I think in the context of sub 36% partnerships, all of my members could operate in all states with m almost all of the product that they offer as a state licensed entity. But what they couldn't do is offer a standardized product nationwide without having a physical location in the, pre in the state or offering the type of products that they offer in a, again, in a standardized format. So, you know, no matter where you live, you have that access. And I think that, you know, the, the point that Scott made is, is the right one, that in the context of the state licensed world, there is hugely abusive products. New York has, a has an APR on rent to own you can be charged two and a half times the price of the good with a term of a year. APR is in triple digits. Now their state rate cap is 25%. So if you can't get a 24%, 25% loan from a firm at Walmart to purchase the washer dryer set, but you can go into, down the street to the rent to own store and be charged 125% APR and be forced to take, make all those payments and you miss one payment and they can take, come and take the washer dryer set back, and that's a product that we support simply because it's state licensed. I just, I just, I think that the the model in the context of sub thirty six percent bank partnerships is a lot of benefit that accrues to both sides, and not one where the only purpose is really to evade state rate caps. In the context where you're literally offering one hundred and forty percent APR products in a thirty six percent APR state, the purpose of that partnership is to evade the rate cap. There's no other. Okay, so I will now ask, answer the question I was asked, and I am going to hook you up with some advocates in New York who would be delighted to have you lobby to fix the rental own law. Count me in. <laughs> okay, so um, as many people in this room know well, and I'm looking at some advocates who claim, can claim credit. There's Suzanne Martindale, I see Marisa Del Torres who can claim credit for this result. So in California, as I think everyone here knows, um, in previous years, the state law capped rates on loans up to $2,500. And sadly, you know, people think of California as progressive. I moved here from North Carolina where, you know, Calif North Carolina leaves California in the dust, I have to tell you, on consumer protection in this way. That's because we have the military is so important there, and the military will not tolerate the stuff that we tolerate here in California. But uh, that aside, until AB 539, what lenders who wanted to re lend above the rate cap, 50%, 60%, 80%, 100%, um, what they would do if a borrower came in and wanted a loan of $2,500, they'd say, huh, you qualify for $2,600. Why don't you take that? Or 3000 Why don't you take that? And that kicked the loan into a world where there was no statutory limit on interest rates. So what AB 539 did was it capped the rates at 36 percent, actually a little higher because there is a, uh, a, a kick up potential based on the federal funds rate. And so now for loans, um, <coughs> excuse me, from 2500 up to 10000 that is the limit. 
And what happened in, in the wake of this bill gaining momentum before it even passed, uh, three prominent lenders here in California whose parent companies are publicly traded, so you know their earnings calls and so forth are publicly available. These are Elevate, Anova, and Curo. Each of these lenders uh, spoke candidly with their investors and said, look, in some states we have bank partnerships, in some states we are state licensed, and if this dreadful California bill becomes law, do not worry, we will simply shut down our state licensed operation in California, kick it over to a bank partnership model, and then we'll continue lending at the rates we've been lending to date. And yes, we'll have to give up maybe a little bit of revenue because you've got to pay the bank something, but it's going to be basically seamless. And so that did a few things. It did, I think, make the point that a thing we often hear, and I also take this the industry concerns seriously. Among other things, we, as I say, are affiliated with credit unions, and uh, we do care about making access to good credit available. Good credit. Um, but, you know, you often hear fintech lenders say, oh, we can't comply with this patchwork of state laws. And that's why we need a, 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 to partner with banks to get a pass from the patchwork of state laws so that we can uh, get the benefit that banks have. But I think that these three companies kind of give strong reason to question that, because these companies not only were perfectly happy to become state licensed in, in places, they preferred to be state licensed in places where they were happy enough with the rate cap. They just, in fact, they preferred it because they didn't have to kick over any revenue to a bank partner. Their real issue was not the so-called patchwork of state laws. Their real issue was interest rate caps. And I would suggest that we need to be, I think, clear on what we're talking about. Are we really objecting? In a world of uh, fintech and compliance tech, where we can screen customers for any number of things across the country, are we really not able to put an interest rate screen on, on our technology? That feels subject to question. So I would say that the impact of these three companies' public pronouncements was it did really make clear that their real objection is not to having to comply with various state laws, but rather with having to live under rate caps that were below what they wanted. Um, I should say that none of them has begun offering, rolling out these new products yet through partnerships. Anova had its more most recent earnings call last week, and they indicated that, yes, they were still pursuing this, but they proprietary reasons, we're not going into details. But I do think that this bit of information is enough to tell us what the real issue is. It's, a, it's just they don't like the state limits. Okay, so uh, I want to bring Eileen into the yes. conversation. Um, the, um, uh, you may want to chime in about AB 539, too. I know you were involved with that. But, but I, I wanted to ask you about... Um, the uh, the governor's proposal to create, I guess, what some people are calling a sort of mini CFPB in California, making changes to DBO. Um, and, you know, I think you've looked at the proposal. If you can tell us, give us your thoughts on how that may, you know, if those legislative changes are enacted, how they may sort of uh, feed into this issue of, of bank, you know, the topic of the panel, bank fintech partnerships that'd be thanks great. thanks yeah. and this the irony is I've waited this long to talk and I'm going to start my answer with a caveat but it's an important caveat um, my <laughs> opinions here they're my own I'm not here speaking on behalf of my chair or my committee there's also a very important caveat I have when I speak about the budget trailer bill language uh, the Newsom administration has made it very very clear in rolling out this this new Department of Financial Protection and Innovation that they expect that proposal to be vetted through the budget process and not through the policy process. For that reason, I have to be very, very careful. I can't step on the toes of my budget colleagues, and I don't want to get out in front of my chair until and unless my chair tells me that our committee will have some sort of a role. So I've spent a lot of time looking at this budget trailer bill since the language was available this weekend. Happy to talk about what's in it, what's not in it, and ways in, ways in which I personally think it might impact the bank partner debate. But please understand, 
as a committee consultant at this point, I do not envision that I will have any sort of a formal role in the, in the evolution of the Department of Business Oversight into the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. So with that, um, very broad overview of the trailer bill. And if any of you want to find it, you can go onto the Department of Finance website, click on the budget tab, pull down the trailer bill language tab, and within that trailer bill language tab, you'll see it under general government. Um, the trailer bill will rebrand the Department of Business Oversight into the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Those of you very familiar with Dodd-Frank are going to see a lot that's familiar in there. Um, the trailer bill defines a term covered person. And under this trailer bill, a covered person is all of DBO's existing licensees, as well as any other entity that offers financial products or services in California and their service providers. Um, in supporting language to go along with their, what's called a budget change proposal, their request for additional bodies, DBO estimated that there will be 9,000 new covered persons subject to this new broad authority. The trailer bill then gives DFPI UDAP authority over all of these covered persons. Now, not just unfair and deceptive acts and practices, but unfair, deceptive, and abusive acts and practices authority. It directs DBO to enforce the unfair and deceptive aspects in consistent with Business and Professions Code Section 17200 and all of its associated case law. And it uses the Dodd-Frank definition of abusive when directing DFPI to enforce the abusive standard. Like the current CFPB, or don't like the current CFPB, but I think they did a great job just a couple weeks ago in highlighting the fact that there's not a lot of clarity currently around what abusiveness means. So, um, so it is possible that you're going to have DFPI interpreting the abusive standard at the state level simultaneous with CFPB interpreting the abusive standardness at the federal level. Um, now, when it comes to DFPI's authority over covered persons, DBO's got UDAP authority, it's got broad rulemaking authority, examination and enforcement authority, and the authority to require reports. Um, the, and one of the other things in the, in the uh, trailer bill is it changes California's industrial loan law to make it easier for companies to form <laughs> ILCs in California. Um, it, it does so by striking language that the, the person can only be engaged in activities permitted for bank holding companies. And instead, it says the company must be predominantly engaged in financial activities as defined under 12 CFR 242.3. And what that means is 85% of one's assets or annual gross revenues has to derive from financial activities. So if you combine those two things, I, I see a couple of potential ways in which this new trailer bill could weigh in on or impact the bank partner debate. And certainly, following on what Ellen said, there's been a great deal of discussion in California since 539 was enacted about the extent to which the rate caps it imposed could be circumvented through means of bank partnerships. Um, it doesn't appear that that's happening at an extensive, to an extensive degree right now, but there is an open question as to whether it could happen. So hypothetically, this trailer bill passes um, either as of July 1 of 2020 or as of January 1, 2021, whatever the operative date is, the new Commissioner of Financial Protection and Innovation will have UDAP authority over all covered persons. I think it is entirely possible that a commissioner could say a non-depository, a non-bank that is now a covered person subject to UDAP, to California's regulators UDAP authority, the act of facilitating a loan that is made at an interest rate higher than that at which that entity would be required to lend if it lent directly, I could see hypothetically a regulator pointing to that act as abusive and pursuing an enforcement action 
against that as an abusive practice. It's not clear to me from reading the trailer bill language that it gives the California commissioner the ability to go directly after the bank. Some may disagree, um, but I think the way in which the trailer bill refers only to those consumer, federal consumer financial laws that are enumerated in Dodd-Frank, those laws don't reference the National Bank Act, they don't reference the depository institutions, <laughs> DITA, whatever it is. Um, so I think it, it's more of an open question as to whether DFPI could go directly after a bank. But I don't think there's any question as to whether the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation could go after a covered person that is, a, that is facilitating a loan made by a bank. The other aspect of the trailer bill that I think may have implications for the bank partnership discussion is if California starts licensing a whole bunch of new ILCs, I think our regulator would have something to say about the rates at which those ILCs lent. So while you currently have some Utah chartered ILCs that might be willing to lend above 36%, it would be interesting to see what the California regulator would say to California-based ILCs if the subject of rates came up. Wouldn't it be subject to the state's interest rate cap? Because the it's a home doesn't state have an for banks? Is state it banks are totally exempt from all, all the yeah, state's rate they, caps? They have an exemption from the state constitution's usury law. Todd. Nat and Scott, do you have um, any any thoughts on the governor's proposal, kind of how it would impact, um, you know, in, in Nat's case, you know, your member companies are, in Scott's case, a firm in particular, and, and, and um, uh, do, do you think it's, yeah. you know, on balance a good idea or not? Um, I don't want to pivot too hard, but okay. I, I do remember Ellen asking Scott a question, so I just wanted to get Sorry. back to that. No, no, I, I'm not, I don't disagree with that, but I think it's a, a crucial point, and then I promise to okay. take a minute and we'll get, Okay. to that is that, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say uh, the state preemption is not a factor of bank partnership. That's the, the, the model. But I would disagree as now that is that it's the determining factor. I think when you have true rent a charter uh, explicit actors going after state usury caps, I think that's the example of, of who we're all worried about. It's bad for consumers. It's bad for a firm. It's bad for the MLA when it's kind of that willful. I think when you look at a firm's model, and you just look at our average APR of 17% and say a state interest rate cap, just pick one that's a little lower than that at 10%, the spread on that APR for a $500 simple interest installment loan over nine months is about $20, $30. Don't check my math, but it's no more than 40. So the primary motivation of that preemption is not a business, uh, it, it doesn't help on the balance sheet. It's not a, business, a sustainable business model. It's the standardization that a firm can offer that across the board to everyone. That That's the, the real impetus for the model. And I think that it brings in a lot of the financial innovation that you said, the uh, supervised machine learning and underwriting, the, the disparate impact concerns. Like It brings in fintech into a highly regulated space of, of, of uh, regulatory scrutiny. So we work with Cross River one of the most uh, highly regulated states for, for banks in the country. They're capped at 30% APR. So that partnership, that investment in that model, the compliance, the legal, the product team, wouldn't be sustainable if the, the primary motivation is to make that $40 off a of state preemption of a, you know, the 12 to 17. So it's a factor. I'm not going to sit here and say it's not, but it's for the standardization of the product to be able to offer what we can. And, and I think that's a distinct from the, the true explicit rent-to-charter uh, organizations that you mentioned, and I think that's where we're all aligned. And I think to serve as many people, I mean, when you look at the, the bulk of the product that the MLA members offer, um, a, a point-of-sale is one example, and the kind of contrasting with the other point-of-sale products that are available, a lot of our product is actually debt consolidation loans, so people that have banks that preempted state interest rate law that got people into debt and we refinance them at a lower rate. So the competition in the market has forced those banks to say, wait a second, we're losing all our customers because these bank partner fintech companies are coming in and refinancing the people, our credit card borrowers who are only making their minimum payment on a 29% loan, and they're going in there and refinancing them at 20, right? Giving that person significant savings. And so they're now trying to adjust 
that's like healthy competition coming into the market. And so the bank partner model is what facilitates that in those few states that have a random rate cap like 12. You know, the, the national bank ignored that rate cap. They originated a 28% loan credit card. They got somebody into $20,000 worth of credit card debt. And we come in and offer them a significant 50% reduction in their interest rate in a, in a three-year simple installment loan. But the only way that we can compete in that near prime segment is with a standardized product nationwide so that we can help all those credit card borrowers who get teased into those offers, you know, help them get that debt consolidation product. So our view is that as you look at the possibility for federal and or state legislation, the more that you have a standardized national market at 36 that enables an online safe product to be available at 36% and below, the better off the consumer will be because the more reasonable offers they will get and the fewer times they will go to the rent to own store, the pawn shop, the check cashing store, the places that are state licensed, very lightly regulated, don't disclose APRs and charge APRs in the 300% range. And now, so let me, could, I was just going to say, in, in, your, in, a perfect, in your perfect world, the federal government would step in with some sort of a 36% rate cap. I think what you're seeing with examples like the trailer bill in California is nothing's happening at the federal level. And I think states are and will probably increasingly try to step in and fill the vacuum. Yeah. I think so, that's true. If I could just, so there's something hopeful I want to just point out. <clears throat> I do think what we've heard from both Scott and Nat is that basically, it sounds to me like, you all could comply with state law across the country in a uniform way and that that's really the important thing for you. And so you could accomplish that by finding the most consumer protective state and, compl and setting your product to comply with the most consumer protective state law, state interest rate cap. And you might have to look at a few states because some states are more protective on smaller dollars, some on high. But basically, if you found whatever it would take to comply with the most protective state, then you'd be compliant with all states. And then you could have a uniform product that doesn't violate any state law. And the beauty of that is a few things. But, so first of all, there is not a state AG or regulator in the world who's going to go after you if you're lending at rates that comply with the most consumer protective state laws. And there's not a class action attorney or individual attorney who has the hope of getting a penny in damages if you try to collect on a loan that is at a rate that complies with the most consumer protective state law. So that would solve the regulatory uncertainty problem. It would allow the good guy lenders to lend across the country, and it would not create the problem of undermining state law for what I think we will all agree are abusive loans. If somebody's lending at 60, 80, 100 percent APR, you don't want them in the market. No one should want them in the market. And by fighting for the right to eviscerate, to, to evade state laws, unfortunately, you're casting a net that is very wide that you have no control over. And from what I just heard, you don't need it. I mean, the, the one nuance I'd give is that if Cross River Bank uh, agrees to relocate to, to Maine or, or South Carolina, then maybe we... Yeah, to have that discussion, but I mean, for us, Jersey's pretty tough yeah, for, for us, um, no, all banks aren't created equal, and, and, and we really focus on the partner bank as a model, as an investment, as the, having the IT and policy infrastructure to do this right, um, rather than kind of go just on the interest rate, because I think ultimately the integrity of the product, the compliance, the legal um, investment that our bank partner does, um, you can't you can't find that bank in every state. You, so but I, you can do that. You can partner with Cross River, get all the benefits of whatever. You can partner. <laughs> no, but, we, we, but we but do. Just don't, but don't, don't stand here doing something that makes the case that allows for the evisceration or the evasion of state law. If you love Cross River, stay with Cross River. I God think bless the, them. I think the challenge with that is that some of those state laws are um, so like you know the bank pre I think that's like where the rubber meets the road is 
is how much preemption to where we, I think we all agree, we support 539, we support <laughs> the 36. W the question is how much uh, preemption, how much rate exportation, how much sort of standardization do you get with a bank partner model? I think, you know, when you talk about what's in this trailer bill, we are very supportive of transparency to the states. We, we don't want to have states feel like because we, you know, we've reported all of our loan activity to New York, we like, we don't want states to feel like because our members are utilizing the bank partner model, nothing to see here. You go challenge the bank in Utah or New Jersey, ignore it. Like we have a, this ongoing dialogue with the states because we can prove that our products are lower rate, <laughs> lower rate than other bank originated products into that state and also lower rate than other state licensed products and much more consumer friendly in other terms, fixed rate, fixed term, fixed term, uh, no prepayment penalties, no late fees. You know, th these examples that show why this this market is growing and i think our rejoinder to the invitation of you know we'll seek out the toughest consumer protection you know state um maybe california could become that maybe california could apply its 36 percent rate cap to the banks and then banks could be forced to originate and maybe you know our members could become ilcs in the state of california and export california's 36 percent rate cap you know maxed and, and be subject to all the new dbo protections that model is one where if California became the toughest state in the nation from that perspective, that might be attractive. Still, though, valid when made would be important because we would still need to be able to sell the, the loans into the secondary market to provide funding because the banks are not going to have J.P. Morgan sized balance sheet. So even if our members became banks in the toughest state you could imagine and exported that toughest state's consumer protections across the country but did so in a standardized way, we would still need valid when made to be the law of the land because we still need to be able to sell those loans in Norton to the investor community. Can I ask um, Eileen a question? Do, do you understand? <laughs> yes. The trail, since you've been seeped in it since this weekend while I've been recovering from a cold, <laughs> do you understand the trailer bill? to allow non-depositories to become ILCs? Uh, to the extent they meet the yes. definition of predominantly engaged in financial activities. Which could include just lending over the internet. If 100% uh, if, if, if of what they do is lend over the internet, under this bill they could become an ILC? If they meet the definition of 12 CFR 242.3, that's the way I read the language. Now, the trailer bill, they still have to get federal deposit insurance of application approval. And so you can't, you know, to become an, uh, an actual regulated bank doesn't just mean you can just get so in California. It's an, it's an incredibly involved and challenging, challenging process. Yeah, it's, a, it's sort of like a fintech charter, no? Yeah. I, <laughs> it right. could be. I mean, it's, it's, if you, in the trailer bill, it's 1252 of the financial code. And it I, really, it makes one minor modification to California's existing law with respect to ILCs, and that it includes definitions, um, which are merely clarifying. Okay. I'm sorry to leave it there. I think I'm being told where I need to wrap it up. But thanks to the panelists.